Chapter 21, Measuring Vital Signs. So a basic tool that nurses use to care for their patients are the vital sign assessments. Um, vital signs answer basically basic questions about the patient's health status. So they're indicators of what the patient's health status may be, as well as they help to understand, help you to understand changes in the patient's conditions. So the absence of a pulse, the respirations, or blood pressure literally means that um, life has ceased to exist for your patient. Uh, temperatures that are extremes high or extremely low can also result in death as well. And so many variables affect a patient's vital signs, including their age, their activity level, their environment, their stress levels, medications that they may be taking, their health status, and so on. Um, so nurses must use critical thinking skills and take into consideration all variables when interpreting the significance of vital signs. So your vital signs are your temperature, your pulse, your respiration, your blood pressure, and your fifth vital sign is considered um, your pain level. So you should always be assessing pain level when you're assessing vital signs as well. So proper functioning of life-sustaining body processes rests on maintaining uh, an optimal environment. So this includes maintaining the core body temperature, which is the um, temperature deep inside the body. So uh, regulation of the core body temperature, which is called thermoregulation, is achieved by maintaining a balance between heat production and heat loss. So to warm the body, the hypothalamus will send out a signal that causes shivering. Shivering in turn increases metabolism or the energy production, which in turn increases um, body heat. Vasoconstriction, which is a narrowing of the blood vessels, occurs simultaneously. So the combined effect of the heat conservation and um, or the heat production, rather, depending on the needs of the body, is, is what occurs with the shivering and the uh, vasoconstriction. And when the body is too hot, the hypothalamus sends out a signal that triggers sweating. Um, and also vasodilation occurs during, uh, during this process, which is an expansion of the blood vessels to increase blood flow to the vessels uh, close to the body surface. So the blood is then cooled through the processes of radiation conduction, convection, and evaporation. So just to put it in, simpler, in simple terms, shivering and vasoconstriction um, occur to help increase the body's heat and then um, diaphoresis or sweating in conjunction with uh, peripheral dilation occur to uh, help decrease the body's heat if the body is too hot. So the normal temperature range is can be influenced by a patient's uh, by your activity level, your age, your environmental temperature, your hormones, your route of assessment. So is it oral, is it uh, rectal, tympanic, uh, temporal, axillary, uh, your uh, uh, rectal and your tympanic um, are going to be a degree higher than your oral and your temporal and axillary will be a degree um, lower than your oral temperature. Um, stress level also impacts uh, your body temperature. The time of day can impact your body temperature. Uh, whether you have diseases present or not, all those things can impact a person's um, body temperature. So if you have a fever that's called pyrexia, make sure you get to um, know different uh, medical terms. Pyrexia, P Y. R-E-X-I-A, that's a fever, and uh, a temperature higher than 
100.2 degrees Fahrenheit is considered to be um, a fever. And so, um, you know, different things can cause a person uh, to have a fever, like especially bacteria or infection um, entering into the body. Um, when you have high temperatures, the term is called hyperthermia. When you see the prefix hyper in front of something, that means it's higher than. Um, and so hyperthermia, like I said, can be caused by um, if you have an infection or bacteria entering the body, different disease processes, um, excessive exposure to heat or whatnot. And then when you see the prefix hypo, H-Y-P-O, that means less than. So if you see hypothermia, that means uh, your temperature is decreased. And um, prolonged exposure to cold can cause a person to um, experience hypothermia. And so we'll talk a little more in detail um, about those things in a little bit here. So the pulse rate or a person's heart rate measures a person's cardiac contractions, which can be felt through uh, the arterial wall. Um, pulse rates can be affected by a variety of things, such as a person's age, their sex, their general health status. Um, for example, infant and children normally have higher pulse rates than adults, and women tend to have higher heart rates than um, than men. Also, patients with infections tend to have a higher pulse rate as well. So, <clears throat> the person's pulse is typically found by either palpation or by um, auscultation. So, when we're palpate endpoints, we have some common pulse points. Um, your radial pulse or your radial um, artery, which is uh, in the wrist at the base of the thumb. Um, you also have your temporal artery, which is just um, in the front of the ear. You have the carotid artery, which is um, the front side of the, of the neck. Um, you have your femoral artery, which is in the groin. Uh, you have your apical pulse, which is uh, at the uh, apex of the heart and so that um, also keep in mind the apical pulse is uh, on the left side uh, mid clavicular fifth intercostal space you have the popliteal pulse which is behind the knee uh, you have the dorsalis pedis um, pulse which is the uh, top of the foot and then the posterior tibialis which is um, behind the ankle and so um, a lot of different things we said, uh, one thing we said can impact a person's pulse rate was infection. But a lot of other things can impact a person's pulse rate as well. Um, if you have a fever, if you have pain, if you have um, hypoxia or anxiety, if you're exercising, if you've got cardiac diseases as well, those things can also um, impact your uh, your heart rate um, now just because a person gets older it doesn't mean that their pulse rate is going to change however um, a lot of times some older adults may have different cardiac diseases or cardiac issues that may cause um, dysrhythmias and so that's why they may have the dysrhythmia dysrhythmias. Um, so just because you get older, it's not necessarily mean you're going to have some type of um, altered pulse rate. So respirations are an involuntary function that's controlled by the respiratory center, which is located in the pons and medulla of the, um, of the brainstem. Breathing is the body's way of taking in oxygen and getting rid of um, carbon dioxide. And so it also assists in some um, acid-base balance as well um, on a short-term basis. So accurate assessment of the respiratory status is very important because it provides information that 
um, if acted on in a timely manner, could save a person's life. And um, on the other side of that, failing to recognize cues that's provided in respiratory assessment data could also be deadly. Um, so the act of breathing involves taking in oxygen into the lungs, which is your inspiration, and uh, expelling carbon dioxide from the lungs, which is your expiration. So one respiratory or ventilation is equivalent to one inspiratory plus one expiration. So when assessing respirations during the vital sign assessment, you as the nurse count the number of respirations and observations um, for the rhythm and, and the rhythm and depth. So one full inspiration and expiration is going to equal one um, uh, one. In, in your um, as you're counting uh, your respirations so you can count um, your respirations using your second hand watch for 30 seconds and multiply it by two um, if there's anything that's irregular about their respirations you want to count it for a full minute all right so your blood pressure. The blood pressure is a measurement of the pressure that's exerted by blood flowing through uh, the arteries at two points. One, when the heart is contracting, contracting, which is your systolic blood pressure, and two, when the heart is relaxing, which is your diastolic uh, blood pressure. So your systolic is um, the heart contracting, the diastolic is the um, heart relaxing. Um, your blood pressure depends on the amount of circulating blood in the body, um, your cardiac output, and the condition of your, um, your vascular bed. So what do your blood vessels um, uh, look like? Um, are they blocked? Are they, you know, constricted or, you know, dilated? All those things can make a difference um, in what your blood pressure may be. So as the volume of blood increases or the elasticity of the blood vessels decreases, the blood pressure increases. And the blood pressure decreases when the volume of blood flow decreases or the elasticity of the blood vessel increases. So basically what that means is if the amount of circulating blood in the body increases or say your cardiac output increases, your blood pressure is going to increase. So if you're in fluid overload, your blood pressure is going to increase. And the opposite, um, if the uh, fluid volume in the body decreases or your cardiac output decreases, or um, yeah, if your, 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 the blood flow in the body decreases, then your blood pressure is going to decrease. So if you're dehydrated, your blood pressure is going to decrease. Um, a lot of different things can affect um, a patient's normal blood pressure. For example, um, your posture can affect your blood pressure, whether you're exercising, whether you're eating, um, what are your emotions, are you resting, what's your weight like, um, what's the environmental temperature, all these different things can impact what your blood pressure may be. As a person ages, um, you may start to notice some changes in their vital signs as well. For example, um, temperature changes. Um, they start to have um, heat loss um, easier. Their metabolic rate tends to decrease as well. Um, and so these things tend to cause the individual to be colder. If you've ever walked in a room um, for of an elderly patient, and it's 90 degrees outside, but yet they've got the heat on 90 in their room and they've got blankets and sweaters on um, because they are so cold and you're, you know, burning up or whatnot. So um, they have they have decreased um, metabolic rate. Right. And they start to have more heat loss. Um, also, because of changes in um, in lung capacity, um, maybe. Uh, the lungs aren't expanding as well. Maybe um, 
uh, you know, things like that. And so then that causes some um, respiratory changes, uh, blood pressure changes as well. Now, because of over time, maybe there's a hardening of the arteries. So remember, we said um, vasoconstriction and vasodilation can alter our blood pressure as well. So vasoconstriction, meaning the blood um, vessels are getting smaller, is going to cause our uh, our blood pressure to go up. So if over the years, maybe you've had a diet high in fat, high in cholesterol, that's caused your arteries to, um, you know, start to block. That's going to cause your blood pressure to go up. Maybe you've had a diet high in sodium. Um, sodium follows, uh, water follows sodium. That's going to cause your uh, blood pressure to go up. And so, you know, those things can impact a person's um blood pressure as well when they get older and so having um, a proper diet can uh, help to control your blood pressure so low sodium diet um, low cholesterol low fat diet um, these things can help to control that blood pressure um, depending on how bad it is you know the individual may need to be on um, medications as well to help you know help with that Okay, so um, a normal body temperature. A normal body temperature is 97.5 degrees to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 36.4 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. Make sure you understand how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, I have placed a video on um, Blackboard for you to view, so go back and review that if you're unsure but remember if we're trying to determine celsius then we would take our fahrenheit number minus 32 and then divide that by 1.8 if we're trying to determine our fahrenheit number then we would uh, multiply 1.8 times whatever the celsius number is and add 32 um, is the uh the uh formulas to to do the conversions but again like i said you can watch the videos on um, blackboard as to how to do that um, remember we said we can take temperatures orally rectally axillary um, tympanic or temporal so correct placement of the uh, thermometer during the temperature measurements is uh, is required and so incorrect placement may result in an inaccurate reading or um, injury in some instances. So when we're uh, taking the oral temperature, you're gonna place that in the posterior sublingual area, which is under the tongue. So the posterior sublingual um, area on either side. So that's under the tongue. Um, the rectal temperature should be inserted into the anal opening. And so the insertion distance is gonna vary depending on the age of the patient. And so when we're talking about um, uh, axillary, the nurse should ensure that the thermometer is in contact with the skin of the armpit when placing the thermometer for the axillary temperature. And then um, the nurse should inspect the ear canal carefully and remove any earwax uh, before doing a tympanic. Uh, if, if you can't remove the earwax, then you might need to choose um, an alternate route. Um, additionally, for the when taking a tympanic, the earlobe should be gently pulled up and back for adults and children three years of age. Um, it should be uh, down and back for children, children younger than three years of age, I should say, down and back for children younger than three, three years of age. Um, a glass thermometer um, was traditionally, traditionally we used a glass thermometer um, to check temperatures. Um, but you have to be careful if you're using a glass thermometer, um, it should be used with caution. Um, and it is never used orally if a patient is uncooperative or at risk for biting the thermometer because of the danger of 
mercury poisoning and injury um, if the glass breaks or anything like that. So um, they're not very common. Um, there are still some glass thermometers around, but it's not really common or used as frequently because of that risk of the mercury poisoning if the glass um, should break. Um, if you are using a glass thermometer, um, you want to make sure you're reading the mercury level uh, at eye level. Um, uh, also, there are one-time disposable strips are available. But keep in mind, you know, no matter what method you're using, um, you need to be using uh, the probe covers and disposing of the probe covers appropriately. Okay. Also, um, one thing I didn't mention when doing a rectal temperature, you want to use a water-based lubricant um, on the probe cover um, prior to inserting uh, the probe covers. We've already talked about, um, you know, lots of different things that can impact a person's temperature, the time of day, um, their sleep-wake cycles, their environment, their age, exercise, also menstrual cycles and pregnancy can impact um, of what a person's temperature might be. Uh, are they stressed? Are they emotional? Are there diseases present? Are they using certain drugs? Um, you know, eating, drinking, mouth breathing, all the other thing I wanna say about that too, oral temperatures, make sure the person has not um, eaten or drinking anything or smoked within the past uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, because that will impact, you know, what their temperature is. Um, if they have, you need to come back in 20 minutes or so or um, or just choose an alternate route prior to, um, prior to uh, you know, taking that oral temperature. Choose an alternate route or, or just come back. Um, remember, we said that your rectal, uh, temperatures are going to be one degree higher than your oral and your axillary temperatures are going to be one degree lower. Your tympanic temperature is going to give you your core body temperature, which is the temperature of your deep pot, deep tissues of the body. Okay, so some uh, problems when we're talking about temperature regulation, hyperthermia or hypothermia. Remember I said if you have the prefix hyper in front of the word, it means increase. Hypo means decrease. So hyperthermia is um, uh, extreme temperature or very high temperature. And so remember we said um, pyrexia, that meant fever. Uh, a pyrexia or just a fever was 100.2. However, however, if you have hyper Perthermia, that's extreme body temperature. So that's going to be um, 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And so the issue when we have these ex extremely high temperatures um, is the body cells um, can get damaged, um, especially in the central nervous system. So the central nervous system where your brain and spinal cord um, are those areas, the brains, the body cells can become damaged. Um, so we want to, you know, try to do things to decrease, decrease that. Um, a person with a fever, uh, a lot of times when you have infection, uh, you, your body temperature goes up and causes you to have a fever. And that's its way of trying to uh, fight off or destroy the, the bacteria. So if you do have a fever, there's some things that, you know, you can do to try to um, try to decrease that temperature because, like I said, we don't want your body temperature to go too high and start to, uh, you know, destroy or damage some of those um, body cells. Um, you want to increase the person's fluid intake. You want to lower the um, room temperature. That's something else you can do. Um, increase the circulating air in the, in the person's room. Um, remove any excessive clothing or uh, bed covers. Um, you want to control or reduce the amount of um, activity that they're having, their body activity. Because remember, we said we said that shivering is going to increase heat. So you don't want them shivering. You don't want them doing a lot of activity.
activities because that's going to increase the person's heat. Um, you can provide a sponge bath or um, even they even have cooling blankets. And sometimes you might need antipyretics. Antipyretics are your fever reducers. So your Tylenol, your aspirin, things like that. Something that's going to bring that temperature uh, down. So hypothermia, hypothermia is um, excessively low body temperature. And so um, excessively low body temperature is going to cause the cell activity to decrease. And then the person will eventually become sleepy. And um, if it's not resolved, they can go into um, a coma. So different people that are so when we say hypothermia, that means your body temperature is not at 94 degrees or lower. So you're at 94 degrees or lower. And so a lot of different people are at risk for um, hypothermia. Infants are at risk for hypothermia. Um, your surgical patients in the operating room. Elderly patients um, that's exposed to cold for a long period of time. Um, people that are exposed to um, extremely cold weather. For an extended period of time. Um, if you're exposed to um, cold water, you know, you can develop hypothermia. Uh, so uh, things that we want to do for our patient with hypothermia, you want to increase the room temperature. You want to provide a warm blanket, uh, provide warm liquids to help warm them, uh, protect the patient from you know, you don't want to have cold circulating air in the room. So, you know, uh, protect them from that. Uh, protect their extremities. You want to monitor their extremities for frostbite. Uh, and you want to gradually return the body to a normal temperature. So if you do it too quickly, um, you can cause, uh, cause tissue damage if you're doing it too, too quickly. So you want to um, gradually return the body um, to a normal temperature. Okay, Allison is taking the temperature of her patient. Which of the following is true when taking a patient's temperature? Okay, so your answer here is going to be three. Glass thermometers must be left in place under the tongue for at least three minutes to be accurate. Uh, because glass thermometers, like we said, you have to leave them in place to be accurate. The rectal temperature is usually uh, one degree higher and the axillary temperature is usually one degree lower. And the tympanic membrane uh, is a good indicator of core body temperature. So. That's why your others are incorrect and your answer is going to be three. Okay, question two. Allison's patient has a fever of 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Allison should perform all of the following nursing interventions to reduce her patient's fever except... Your answer here is going to be number one, decrease fluid intake. So if a patient has a fever, the nurse should encourage fluids unless it's, on, unless it's contraindicated um, to prevent dehydration. Okay, so these are just your theory objectives for the second half of the um, presentation. Okay, so we have already discussed all of these um, pulse points and where they're located, your radial, your temporal, your carotid, femoral, uh, apical, popliteal, um, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibialis. Um, we've discussed all of these. Um, so just keep in mind a couple things I just wanted to point out here. The most common site that's used to assess the pulse um, for your routine vital sign assessment is your, your radial pulse. And so remember that one's located um, on the thumb side of the inner wrist. And so all we need um, 
you know, is your second, your watch with your second hand is the only equipment you need to assess this. Um, when you're assessing pulses, one thing I wanted to point out, you're going to assess both sides. So when I'm doing my temporal, I'm going to do, you know, both temporals at the same time or radio just to kind of see is one pulse weaker than the other. Uh, we should be when we're measuring our pulses, we want to measure the rate, the rhythm and the regularity of the pulses. Now, like I said, you're going to measure them both at the same time. However, when you're measuring your carotid, you're not going to measure those at the same time. You'll measure those one at a time when you're measuring your carotid arteries because um, palpating both carotids at the same time may significantly impair the blood flow to the brain. And so if it impairs the blood flow to the brain, then, you know, your person could pass out or whatnot if you're not getting blood flow to the brain. So um, though with the carotids, you're going to do uh, one at a time. When we're assessing our pulse rates, you can um, measure for a full minute. And uh, I'm sorry, you can measure for uh, 30 seconds and multiply it times two, or you can measure for a full minute. Now, apical pulse, we're always going to measure apical pulse for a full minute. Also, uh, if we say we do uh, measure a radio for 30 seconds and times it times two, if that pulse is irregular or something's um, not right, you always want to do, uh, then do an apical pulse for a full minute. If your um, pulse is irregular, you always want to do an apical for a full minute when measuring. Okay, so a normal heart rate in your normal um, healthy adult is going to be 60 to 100. In your book, table 21.3, um, that uh, shows you the average rate. So depending on, remember we said that um, your age can impact what your heart rate may be. So like we said, your normal healthy adult um, heart rate is going to be 60 to 100. That's normal. Um, if they're athletic, their heart rate uh, tends to run lower. So athletes may be 45 to 60. Um, your average male, adult male, uh, maybe a little lower than females. Your average adult male may be around 72, whereas your average adult female may be anywhere from 76 to 80. Um, children, remember, children tend to run higher. So around five years of age, they may be their average may be around 95, and um, even younger is even higher. So your one-year-old is about 110, and then your newborn is going to be anywhere from 120 to 160. Um, so when we see the words tacky in uh, the, the, the prefix tacky, that means increase. When you see the prefix brady, that means decrease. So tachycardia means increased heart rate. So remember we said our normal heart rate is 60 to 100. So if a person is tachycardia, tach, tach, has tachycardia, that means their heart rate is greater than 100. And then if they have bradycardia, that means their heart rate is less than 60. So bradycardia less than 60 and um, tachycardia is um, above 100. Um, remember I said anytime you uh, get an irregular radio pulse, you want to make sure you uh, uh, perform a, a apical pulse for a full minute. You're going to perform an apical pulse for a full minute. Um, when you're palpating your pulses, when you're palpating the radio or whatever, you want to make sure you're not pressing down too hard because if you are pressing down too hard, you could actually occlude the pulse and not feel it. So make sure you're not pressing down um, too hard there. The other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, a pulse deficit. Now, a pulse deficit, it's the difference between uh, the apical pulse and the radial pulse. So the difference between the apical pulse and the radial pulse. And so the way you um, determine the, um, the pulse deficit, you need two nurses. Um, so you'll have um, the nurses using the same, they have to use the same 
um, crop. So two people required to obtain the pulse deficit. So you have one person that'll count the apical heart rate using the stethoscope. And then the other person will count the um, radio pulse rate. And so both will um, start and stop counting at the same time. And they should be using the same um, clock with the second hand to measure the, the pulse rate. And so um, the uh, radio pulse is subtracted from the apical pulse and that will give you your pulse deficit. If um, a pulse deficit, a person can have a, a you know, a, a high pulse deficit if there's um, like an, a, a person has an arrhythmia or something like that. Also, remember, we talked about different things that can impact your um, your pulse rate. And that is you also have a chart there on um, table 21.2, page 366 goes through some of the, what things that we already talked about, you know, that can impact your um, your pulse rate, your age, which we just, you know, discussed um, your body build and size, because like we said, with athletes, they also will be lower. Um, your blood pressure can impact it, you know, if you're taking any drugs, what your emotions are like, if you have blood loss, um, you're exercising, um, all these different things can um, impact your pulse. If you have fever, if you have pain, you know, um, you know, how physically fit you are. So these are all just some things that can impact your pulse rate. Okay, so when assessing a person's pulse, you're going to assess the rate and the rhythm. Um, uh, An arrhythmia just means it's um, uh, irregular. There's some irregularity or some skip beats or something like that. You want to know the strength of the pulse. Um, if it's a weak, um, weak and regular, but regular, um, then you would con uh, consider that to be a one plus. If it's strong and regular, then it would be considered uh, a two plus. If it's full and bounding, then it would be considered uh, a three plus. So pulses can be um, thready, which is weak and irreg irregular. Um, they can um, be feeble, which means they're barely palpable. Um, they could be absent, which means they have no pulse at all. Um, and like I said, you could have an arrhythmia as well, which is just, uh, you know, it's uh, irregular or you're having some, some skip beats. So when you're um, assessing your pulse, you want to make sure you're assessing all these things um, as well for the pulses. Okay, so a normal, normal respirations um, in your normal healthy um, adult will be 12 to 20, 12 to 20. If you look in your book table 21.4, um, it's page 368, there's some um, a chart there table 21.4 that identifies normal range of respirations based on age. So your older adult may be slightly higher, just 16 to 20. Um, your, your normal healthy adult should be around 12 to 20. Um, your adolescent, about 16 to 20. Your child, 20 to 30. Um, your infant is higher, 20 to 40, and your newborn is even a little bit higher at 30 to 80. Newborn is going to be a little bit higher. So when you're measuring your respirations, again, you want to measure your rate, your rhythm, and your depth. The rate is just how many breaths per minute um, they're breathing. The rhythm, the rhythm is assessed by observing the pattern of the rise and fall of the chest. So normally there are equal intervals between the rise and fall of the chest or a regular rhythm. And then symmetry should also be noted. Symmetry is evaluated by comparing the movement of the right side of the chest with the movement of the left side of the chest. And both sides should move at the same time. The depth is evaluated by looking at how much the chest expands. Does it expand a little or a lot? Um, during the routine vital sign assessment, the nurse 
should be um, should make some su subjective uh, evaluations about the depth of the breathing. So minimal expansion of the chest is uh, on a consistent basis that will signify shallow breathing, and then deep breathing is signified by consistent overexpansion of the chest wall. So you want to make sure you make note of the person's rhythm, rate, and depth. Um, remember, you can uh, count the rate uh, by for 30 seconds and multiply that times two. But if there's any irregularities um, or if the person has respiratory issues or whatnot, you want to make sure you count the, the rate for a full minute in, in these individuals. These are some terms that um, you're going to need to to know. Um, apnea, A-P-N-E-A, that means um, you're not breathing at all. So there's an absence of breathing. So we said a normal, normal respirations is 12 to 20. So remember when we said we put that uh, prefix Brady, Brady in front of it, it means decrease. You put that prefix tap tachy in front of it that means increase so tachypenia is increased respiration so that's more than 20 bradypenia is decreased respiration so that's going to be um less than 12 is going to be um uh, bradypenia dyspnea dyspnea means um difficulty breathing or labored breathing so remember i said um you start to learn your medical terms, start to learn different terms because a lot of times people are not able to answer questions because they don't understand different terms. Okay, these are even more terms um, you'll need to get used to. Remember we said dyspnea, that would be difficulty breathing or labor breathing, so they may be short of breath or something like that. But these are some other type respiratory patterns. Um, hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is breathing um, with, in which there is an increase in the rate and depth of the breaths. So this occurs in an individual uh, maybe having anxiety or fear or something like that. Um, chain stokes. Chain stokes is when you have dyspnea followed by a short period of apnea. And so you see chain stokes in your critically ill patient. Cushmoss respirations. Cushmoss respirations is increased rate and depth um, with panting and long grunting and exhalation. And that's going to be seen in a patient with di diabetic ketoacidosis or um, renal failure. And by its respirations. Um, by its respirations is um, shallow, uh, shallow breaths for about... Um, for four to five breaths with a period of uh, of apnea. And remember, we said apnea is a person with um, uh, that's not breathing. So shallow breaths followed by periods of apnea, and so that's going to occur in a patient with um, increased intracranial pressure. There's a, a figure twenty one point. One four on in your book on page three sixty nine that um, kind of goes a little more shows you you know illustrations of this as well. All right, these are just some other um, when, when we're auscultating lung sounds. These are just some adventitious sounds that we may um, hear in individuals. Um, your crackles, your ronchi, um, strider wheezes. Um, and we're going to talk uh, more about these um, in, more in depth when we get to the respiratory chapter. And um, that way you can kind of hear what each one sounds like, um, you know, so you understand, you know, what each one may sound like. But these are some adventitious sounds that uh, that you might hear in your patient. All right, so oxygen saturation is often measured when um, assessing vital signs as well. And so we use a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen saturation um, of the blood. 
and so it's determined the way the way the way it's determined is um, a sensor or a probe is attached to an area of the patient's body in which um, there's an infrared or red light that's used that can be used to reach the capillary blood and so what it's doing is determining the percentage of hemoglobin um, that is bound in the oxygen and so the hemoglobin is what transports the oxygen in the blood and so that's what we're measuring to determine a person's you know oxygen saturation rate the level of um, oxygen in the blood so typically the oxygen saturation the, the probe cover is um, attached to the person's finger um, you want to make sure um, there's not fingernail polish or anything on the nails um, also sometimes um, individuals with arthritis it may be a little bit more difficult um, you, there's also you know you can also use the, the toe to, to measure um, oxygen saturation if the fingers are not available um, there's also clips that you can attach to the earlobe um, if need be um, also infants have an infant's um, foot um, uh, probe cover that they could uh, use to uh, measure oxygen saturation on the infant's foot um, there's also some sense adhesive sensors that they use to apply to the nose or forehead if push come to shove so there's some various ways that we can you know use to try to measure um, the oxygen saturation rate okay so your normal healthy adult typically you have your blood pressure 120 over 80 there's a chart in your book table 21.5 on page 370 it tells you um, the different stages of blood pressure so you can see a normal blood pressure is um, so you've got uh, systolic and diastolic so a systolic less than 120 diastolic less than 80 um, then you can get into um, your elevated or uh, pre hypertensive stage of 120 to 129 for systolic or um, and a diastolic less than 80 so stage 1 hypertension stage 1 hypertension is going to be 130 to 139 for systolic and 80 to 89 for diastolic and then your stage 2 is going to be 140 or higher for systolic or 90 or higher for diastolic is going to be your stage 2 and a hypertensive crisis if your systolic is higher than 180 or your diastolic is um, higher than 120 you can actually um, you know a person put themselves at risk for stroke with blood pressures being that high on that following page table 21.6 it shows you some different factors that can affect a person's blood pressure so like their age their stress level if they're on certain medications or whatever on um, their sex if they're exercising um, with their body position it, it, it can even be different versus um, right arm versus um, left arm you know do they have some um, issues with their blood vessels with vasoconstriction or vasodilation or things like that um, with the blood volume remember I said if your blood volume in the body is decreased your blood pressure is going to decrease so if you're dehydrated um, if you're hemorrhaging or whatever your blood pressure is going to decrease if your blood volume in the body is increased your um, blood pressure is going to increase so if you're in fluid volume overload your blood pressure is going to increase um, anytime you get an abnormal blood pressure I know a lot of these facilities use the Dynamap or electric blood pressure cups anytime you get an abnormal reading using one of those methods you always 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 want to recheck the patient's blood pressure manually because those electronic devices can um, be inaccurate so you always want to recheck um, your blood pressure manually persons with um, 
prolonged, uncontrolled hypertension can have permanent damage to the brain, the kidneys, the heart, um, the retina. So we really want to try to control uh, our patients' blood pressure, keeping them normal. Um, the other thing I want you to make note of is a pulse pressure. What is the pulse pressure and how, we de how do we determine a person's pulse pressure? The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. So say, for instance, my blood pressure is 120 over 80. I would subtract those two. So 120 minus 80 equals 40. So my pulse pressure is 40. So that's important when we get to certain diseases or whatnot, if our pulse pressure is increasing or whatnot. But that's how we determine our pulse pressure. Um, like I said, a lot of different things can affect a person's um, blood pressure um, as well. Okay, so like I said, hypertension. Hypertension is... Um, high blood pressure is what it is and remember um, I just pointed out the chart um, table 21.5 in your book on page 370 that shows the various levels of um, hypertension was considered um, elevated stage 1 stage 2 and hypertensive crisis now keep in mind if you go to the doctor on one occasion and your blood pressure is elevated then they're probably not going to put you on blood pressure medications that day because anything could um, have caused your blood pressure to uh, be increased at that that particular day or time maybe you're anxious maybe you're stressed out maybe you know a lot of different things could be going on um, now if you go to the doctor on two separate occasions two different days two separate occasions and you're having consistently elevated blood pressure then they may look to uh, do some interventions at that point in time um, because keeping in mind prolonged high blood pressure or hypertension can cause damage to various organs such as the brain, the kidney, the heart, the retinas, things like that. Okay, so hypotension, hypo, remember anytime you see that prefix hypo in front of something that's low. So hypotension is low blood pressure. So your blood pressure is going to be um, less than 90 over 60 with hypotension. Um, postural hypotension, postural hypotension. Um, that's when you uh, have a drop in your your blood pressure um, when you change positions, and so um, you would have individuals um, check orthostatic blood pressure. You, you as a nurse would be checking orthostatic blood pressures um, for this individual. Um, things that might cause you to check orthostatic hypo, um, orthostatic blood pressures is maybe your patients having um, lightheadedness maybe they're having dizziness or syncope which is fainting episodes um, or falls or or things like that visual blurring or things like that um, so these things might cause you to check a, um, a orthostatic blood pressure to see if they are having postural hypotension so the way we check the orthostatic blood pressure first you want to have your patient lying down then you're going to check a blood pressure lying down then you want to have them um, assist them to a seated position have them sit for um, a few minutes um, with their legs off the side of the bed and then check a blood pressure again then if they're able to stand have them stand for um, a few minutes and then check a blood pressure again while standing. And so, you know, now they've changed the position. So if the systolic blood pressure drops 20, millimeter, 20 millimeters of mercury or more, or the diastolic blood pressure drops 10 millimeters of mercury or more, then the person is considered to um, have orthostatic hypotension, which is the postural hypotension. Um, because their blood pressure is dropping considerably when they change positions. And so this, you know, like I said, they would be at risk for falls or things like that um, if this is happening. Okay, so pain 
is recognized by the Joint Commission as the fifth vital sign. So anytime you're checking vital signs, you should always um, be checking uh, pain as a vital sign as well. And so pain is whatever your patient says it is. You don't look at your patient and say, oh, you're smiling too much. You're not in that much pain. Pain is whatever your patient says it is. If your patient says it's a 10, it's a 10. If your patient says it's a 1, it's a 1. Whatever they say it is. Um, various tools have been developed to objectively document the patient's um, perception of his or her pain level. And so patients who are mentally alert, they might be asked to rate their pain on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the least amount of pain and 10 being the worst amount of pain. Um, children and um, older adults, particularly those who, um, you know, might be illiterate, they might be shown faces using the Wambaker faces, um, which corresponds with numbers and ask them to identify the face that best correlates to their level of pain. Um, so, you know, there's also tools that have been developed for people that can't communicate. Right. So when we're assessing a pain, well, there's some things we want to make sure we identify um, as also. Um, and you can use the, uh, the acronyms OPQRST to help you remember. So, oh, onset. What was the onset of the pain? What were you doing when the pain started? Does the pain come and go? Is it consistent? What's the onset of that pain? Um, P. Provocation, provocation versus palliation. What makes it better? What makes it worse? What provokes it? What makes it better? What do you do? Do you, um, you know, depending on what is going on, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, Q, quality. What's the quality of the pain? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it burning? Is it stabbing? Is it, you know, what is it like or whatnot? Severity, that's where we're going to rate our pain using whatever pain scale. If it's a scale of 0 to 10 or whatever, we're going to rate the severity of that pain using whatever scale we're using. And you want to make sure you document what type of scale you're using as well. Um, R, region or radiation. So region or radiation, where is it located and does it radiate anywhere else? Right. So we want to make sure, you know, we're assessing those things and then timing again. You know, is it does it come and go or, or whatnot? So you want to make sure you're assessing um, all those things when you're assessing a person's pain level. Question four. Allison's patient has a heart rate of 54 beats per minute. This is defined as the answers to bradycardia. So bradycardia is defined as a slow pulse that is fewer than um, 60 beats per minute. So tachycardia is used to refer to a pulse that's greater than 100 beats per minute. And then an arrhythmia is um, uh, when you have irregularity or skip beats. So Okay. Which is not an appropriate guideline for measuring a blood pressure? So the answer is two. Use the radial artery. The arm should be supported on a surface at the level of the heart. So the nurse should use the brachial artery. You're not going to use the radial artery to measure a blood pressure. You should use the, um, the brachial artery. And so um, the arm should be supported on a surface at the level of the heart. Um, 